Welcome to BRR 350, an introduction to regional bioenergy. We are going to start learning about bioenergy with a short review of the history of the field. Biomass was around before humans, so naturally human utilization of biomass for energy is almost as old as humans themselves. I like to start with this picture of a gas pump hostage situation because I think it captures our current addiction to carbon and the dual role bioenergy might play depending on what path we choose. So let's get started. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. To appreciate bioenergy and where it fits in the mix, it is important to stay objective about most of Earth's major carbon resources. So, oil is not a bad thing, coal is not a bad thing, and biomass is not necessarily a good thing. Fossil fuels and biomass are both just natural carbon resources. So neither one is good or bad, they're both just carbon. That being said, oil and coal can be a bad thing depending on how we use them, and biomass could also be a bad thing depending on how we use it. It's not the carbon resource that's the challenge, it's how we as humans choose to use the carbon resource. Bioenergy has been around for as long as humans have had fire. Biomass was the simplest source of combustible carbon we could get our hands on, and once we learned how to ignite it, the rest was history. Humans love burning carbon because we live in a world made of carbon surrounded by an atmosphere full of oxygen. The combination of carbon and oxygen is just too good to pass up. Plentiful reactants, easy reaction to start, great heat production, Combustion was and still is the king of bioenergy conversions in efficiency, ease, and global utilization. After fire, the next big step for carbon was ethanol. Samuel Moray and one of the earliest internal combustion engines are shown here. Ethanol has been around for a very long time. Humanity discovered fermentation before we figured out civilization and writing. But there isn't clear evidence of alcohol distillation until 12th century Italy. Shortly after we learned how to distill and concentrate alcohol, we learned how to use it for lighting and cooking. Ethanol seems to follow humanity and civilization, so it stands to reason that if a place with a form of writing had a large city, 50,000 plus population, it probably had some kind of alcohol distillation happening, regardless of when it existed. That's BC through AD. As we began exploring the use of ethanol, we also began using vegetable and fish oil for energy. Humanity has been enjoying animal and plant oils and foods and medicines for longer than we have had writing. However, as we began building larger structures and bigger cities, a new industry around lighting emerged. Much like alcohol, there is compelling evidence to support the existence of candles and lamps in just about any place with a form of writing in a large city, regardless of when it existed. So if you are looking to identify where in history humanity started using plant and animal oils for light and heat, it is not unreasonable to assume ancient Egypt or Sumeria. Lamp fuels included all kinds of vegetable oils, animal oils, refined turpentine from pine trees, alcohols, particularly wood alcohol, that's methanol, grain alcohol, and the most popular lamp fuel in the U.S. before petroleum, which was camphene, a mixture of alcohol and turpentine. Back in the 1800s, oils were great, but ethanol was better. Ethanol has always been the people's fuel. It could be produced by anyone with a still, and the feedstock for the process was everywhere. Ethanol stills were extremely commonplace in the 1800s, and it was being commercially produced around the time of the Civil War. Somewhat ironically, as petroleum was struggling to enter the market that ethanol had created and secured, ethanol was taxed incredibly heavily and petroleum, kerosene, became the preferred fuel almost overnight. Another important step along the way was pine sap, also known as naval stores. Believe it or not, the South was primarily settled for the value it brought to the country in the form of pine sap. The North Carolina Tar Heels are named after the laborers that used to harvest the sap or pine tar. Prior to oil, pine sap was a resource that nations went to war over. It was used to make massive wooden ships functional. 
and when it was distilled, it produced a variety of chemicals that were hugely valued at the time, most notably turpentine. Turpentine was used for a lot of things back then, but maybe the most important market was lamp oil. The naval stores industry still exists today, but they are no longer produced by tapping trees. These days, naval stores are generally referred to as pine chemicals and tall oils, which are byproducts of the pulping industry that generates paper. This is still a commercial industry, but it is a fraction of what it once was. And then there was oil. We have only been refining petroleum and using it commercially for about 150 years. You may all even know people who grew up without oil. Just like ethanol and turpentine, the demand for lighting drove a significant amount of the development of oil production and refining. Kerosene was a huge deal and became an even bigger deal after that ethanol tax. The world's thirst for cheap, clean energy in the form of lighting caused oil production to skyrocket by the 1870s. However, it is important to remember that petroleum was not useful until we learned how to refine it into its pieces. Humanity has this tendency to use natural resources faster than they can regrow. And as a result, there is an argument that refining petroleum actually saved whales and protected the piney woods. I do not agree with this argument. We do often use natural resources in an unsustainable manner, but alcohol fuels were quickly overtaking whale oil before kerosene became a thing. The most popular lamp fuel of the time contained turpentine, so perhaps kerosene helped save the piney woods by decreasing the market value of naval stores. But I think even that is a stretch, because while the whale oil industry completely collapsed based on market factors, the naval stores industry continued growing until the 1940s. The lesson here is that markets are decided based on politics, economics, and timing. Despite the success of kerosene, ethanol was far more popular as a fuel in the 1890s than diesel. Once we sorted out oil refining, we all of a sudden had a variety of fuel sources to choose from. By the 1890s, there were dozens of internal combustion and steam engine designs that ran on a dizzying spectrum of fuels. These were soundly defeated by Rudolf Diesel and his diesel engine. The design basis for this engine was fuel flexibility and rote efficiency, and Rudolf succeeded in hitting his mark, thus giving the world an engine design that it continues to use today over 120 years later. It is important to note that electric engines and electric vehicles became competitive at nearly the same time diesel and gasoline vehicles did. Much like the whale oil, naval stores, ethanol, petroleum battle for market share, combustion vehicles were competing with electric vehicles. For a variety of reasons, combustion vehicles advanced and electric vehicles were largely forgotten by the mainstream until a relatively recent resurgence. It is ironic that the same reasons electric vehicles were compelling in the 1900s are the same reasons they are compelling now. It will be interesting to watch the electric car industry this time around. If aluminum welding becomes more standard, the price of carbon fiber drops, and the battery component recycling becomes normal, it can end up being quite competitive. However, those first two conditions also help combustion vehicles, so it's far from a simple projection. Far younger than oil and coal, natural gas only became a heating standard in the 1950s. As we become immersed in the recent natural gas bonanza, it is important to remember how new this resource really is. We have not always had it, and we have not always used it. In many senses, it is a very new fuel, much, much younger than ethanol, naval stores, coal, and petroleum. As more and more of our infrastructure is powered on natural gas, we need to consider what this will mean for our future. The early 1900s were a turning point for carbon as an energy source. It was a perfect storm of energy technologies, and only one or two was going to become dominant. Ethanol, diesel, gasoline, and electric engines were all available and competing. Vehicles had created an incredible demand for portable energy, and mass production was finally becoming mainstream. 
The important takeaway is that the government policies and market conditions of the 19th century are largely responsible for the status quo of the 21st century. It's worth thinking about. Take a moment and review the timeline recap from the early 1800s to the mid to late 1900s. If a market already exists, a better way of doing things can become the new standard very quickly.